Hello. Um, we're going to talk about anesthesia for plastic surgery, liposuction, and non-operating room anesthesia, or better known as NORA. Now, in this section on NORA, I'm going to present just a couple of non-operating room uh, places because I'm giving another lecture specifically on radiology. So even though radiology would be classically lumped into the NORA group, we're going to separate that out. I'm Bobby Jean Schweitzer, and I'm a professor of anesthesiology and critical care and medicine at the University of Chicago. I have no disclosures, unfortunately. So let's start with plastic surgery, and we'll start with a question. A 77-year-old female with mild sleep apnea and motion sickness is scheduled for a facelift under monitored anesthesia care. Which of the following poses the greatest risk? A, intraoperative opioids, causing postoperative respiratory depression. B, midazolam, causing postoperative delirium. C, oxygen delivered via nasal cannula. D, her tongue piercing. Or E, her history of post-op nausea and vomiting. So which of those do you think is going to uh, pose the greatest risk? All of them are concerning, but vote. And yes, auction delivered via nasal cannula. And sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. So airway fires are a very common problem with oxygen. Um, and unfortunately, the airway fires have not decreased over the last 10 to 20 years in spite of a relatively um, significant number of publications drawing our attention to it. But let's talk about some general principles first. Um, plastic surgery is typically done um, in NORA or non-operating room uh, practices, particularly office-based practices, uh, particularly the more cosmetic um, uh, plastic surgery procedures. Um, and it frequently is done with monitored anesthesia care, local anesthetics. Um, because patients are often coming in for procedures that are minimal to those types of anesthetics, and patients want to have minimal discomfort and minimal sort of side effects, um, and um, there are not, uh, they're not being hospitalized, and they're going to be um, you know, uh, discharged to home readiness. So we're not talking about the major reconstructive you know, uh, procedures that many of us are familiar with who work in um, operating uh, rooms or hospitals, but the more that the superficial, minimal, limited cosmetic procedures. Um, there's increasing use of peripheral nerve blocks. Um, I think the big focus is again on minimizing adverse outcomes um, and limiting post-procedure recovery. A need for excellent pain control, post-op nausea and vomiting prevention, and prompt street readiness. So uh, some special concerns, particularly around facial plastic surgery, is one often has very limited or almost no access to the airway. Um, and yet, because the face is highly innervated um, and patients will maybe a bit claustrophobic, it may require relatively moderate to deep sedation. Um, a face mask and a supraglottic airways may interfere with the procedure and they cannot be used. Um, and if one is working in a non-operating room setting, particularly an office space setting, there you may have limited uh, personnel that are familiar with anesthesia and what we do and assisting us with the airway. Um, there's typically a limited tolerance for side effects. These patients come in expecting to have a little plastic surgery, leave looking better and feeling better. Um, so the uh, close attention to uh, treating pain and post-op nausea and vomiting. Um, and then of course, the, the post-op nausea and vomiting could have other uh, side effects such as uh, causing bleeding, um, or swelling with significant retching. And as we showed with that question, there is a significant fire hazard when using oxygen um, if in a face mask or nasal cannula without a closed circuit um, in close proximity to bovies. And even if they're operating up on the eyelids and you have a nasal cannula in the nose and the drapes are placed such that it allows the oxygen to be tunneling up underneath and around the eyes, then a, uh, the bovi can trigger an explosion or burning, and then the drapes catch on fire, and then the patient really needs some plastic surgery. Uh, so what is monitored anesthesia care? Monitor anesthesia care is actually a billing term, and it's used when anesthesia providers, CRNAs or anesthesiologists, provide um, other um, either sedation or the care of a patient undergoing a procedure when the patient is not receiving general anesthesia or the patient's not receiving a regional anesthetic. When non-anesthesia trained providers provide sedation, it is not termed MAC. So it's distinct from sedation. Um, and one of the important um, 
criteria or, or important aspects, I believe, though, is that one must always be prepared to rescue from the next deeper level of sedation than was planned. Because sedation is a continuum from mild sedation all the way up to general anesthesia, um, and it's easy to move between those different um, levels um, without uh, intending to. Um, so uh, MAC requires the same level of monitoring as for GA, according to the American Society of uh, Regional Anesthesiologists, in that it requires electrocardiogram, blood pressure monitoring, the ability to monitor temperature, um, heart rate monitoring. Um, and now, since 2011, entitled CO2 monitoring is required for the maintenance of moderate to deep sedation. If you're giving minimal to mild sedation, then it is, uh, they recommend entitled CO2 be used, but is not mandatory. But it is mandatory um, when giving moderate to deep sedation. Um, it's important to realize that the unique response of each patient, not dissimilar to it is for any treatment or anesthetic, um, but a dose of drug for one patient that results in mild sedation may result in deep sedation in another patient. Um, and because of the, if there's a changing level of stimulus, um, then there needs to be a changing level of sedation. Um, the more stimulus, the more sedation the patient needs. When the stimulus, stimulus goes away, then that patient may move from a lighter level of sedation to a deeper level of sedation simply because of the lack of the stimulus. So this is, slide is a busy slide, but it's important because I believe that they uh, will likely at, make sure that you are aware of sort of the differences between the different levels of sedation and the way one progresses from mild all the way up to general. I've highlighted these also um, by colors in that, you know, yellow is, is, is um, generally the patient has, is, is, that's for minimal sedation, generally the patient has unaffected responsiveness, their airway's normal, their ventilation um, is adequate, and their cardiovascular function is unaffected. And those are four things that, again, I think that they're likely to ask something about, that, you know, which of these things does, does sedation is important? And is responsiveness of the patient, is their ability to maintain their airway, the ability to actually ventilate, not just maintain an airway, um, and their cardiovascular function, their heart rate, rhythm, blood pressure. So the next level up is moderate sedation. I've highlighted that in orange. Um, it's a little bit riskier. Um, and this used to be termed conscious sedation, but we've gotten rid of the term conscious sedation. Um, and now it's minimal, moderate, deep, and general. Um, so here the patients generally maintain purposeful response to verbal or tactile stimuli. Um, uh, and it, the purposeful response is not just withdrawing from painful stimulus, that is not purposeful, but if, if the patient, you know, um, reaches their other hand over to try to like remove um, the surgeon's hand from doing, causing some kind of, of pain. Um, usually the airway uh, is maintained on its own. There are no interventions required. The patient's breathing adequately. And generally their blood pressure and heart rate um, are within normal limits, though you, the one may see some slight decrease in uh, blood pressure. Deep sedation, I've highlight that in red, much more concerning, warning, because much more perturbation now of, of these parameters. Um, so typically the patient, again, should be able to respond to purposeful stimuli, not just withdrawing to pain, um, but generally it may require a little more, a louder voice, a little shaking of the patient, or perhaps, you know, a much more painful stimulus um, or repeated exposure to that painful stimulus. Um, here, generally, the airway uh, is, is not completely uh, adequate. The patient may require um, a supplemental oxygen, a, their head turned a little bit to prevent obstruction, or even an airway. oral airway. Um, and again, ventilation may not be adequate here. The patient may need a draw thrust. Um, they may need supplemental oxygen um, to maintain oxygenation. Um, they may need a little turn of their, their head to avoid obstruction. And uh, usually cardiovascular function is maintained. Again, one is not surprising to see a drop, slightly drop in blood pressure um, or uh, decrease in heart rate, but generally it doesn't require any intervention. Um, general anesthesia, highlighted in blue there because th that general anesthesia, sort of a blue, that may result in a a hypoxic patient or a patient who is, doesn't have adequate oxygenation. Um, it's, general anesthesia can, is, it should only be given by patients, by uh, providers who are trained in, to provide anesthesia. So that means by CRNAs or um, anesthesiologists. Everybody else can give uh, any of those levels of sedation, though generally it's encouraged that people only purposely target 
at most moderate to deep sedation because since one must be prepared to rescue from the next higher level of sedation, you can see that only anesthesiologists typically are trained to deliver general anesthesia. So typically, they people may not be prepared unless they're anesthesiologists or CRNAs to rescue from the level of general anesthesia. But here, that's the, the you know the, the the definition of general anesthesia is the patient does not respond to a painful stimulus. Um, Again, intervention of the airway is often required. Frequently, there is inadequate ventilation, and um, cardiovascular function may be impaired. So commonly used drugs to deliver uh, sedation um, are uh, benzodiazepines and hypnotics. Benzodiazepines, most commonly, uh, we use midazolam. In the past, diazepam uh, hurt quite a bit on injection, so it wasn't used very often intravenously. Uh, but there's a newer preparation out for several years now that is much um, less painful, and so people do use it, but it has a longer half-life, it has an active metabolite, um, so midazolam is more commonly used. Uh, benzodiazepines offer anxiolysis, amnesia, sedation, and they can cause respiratory depression, particularly if combined with opioids. Uh, the, the, the classic hypnotic used for sedation is propofol. Um, propofol uh, causes, results in anxiolysis, amnesia, sedation, and can result in profound respiratory depression. Um, Dexmedetomidine is another commonly used um, sedation medication. It's a selective alpha-2 agonist. Um, it is um, excellent in providing anxiolysis, amnesia, sedation. It can decrease cardiac output. It can decrease blood pressure. It can result in bradycardia. Um, it does not cause any nausea and vomiting, much like propofol. It does not result in nausea and vomiting. And it has uh, essentially no respiratory depression. Um, Let's do a question. Which of the following is associated with ketamine? A, awareness of anesthesia. B, analgesia. C, hypotension. D, bradycardia. E, a greater risk of aspiration compared to other hypnotics. So which of these are associated with ketamine? Vote. One of them is correct. The others are all incorrect. Yes, analgesia. Ketamine is not an opioid, but it, cause, it results in, in significant analgesia through the NMDA receptor mechanism. Um, so ketamine is a fencyclidine derivative. It's an old anesthetic that's been around for a number of years. Um, it used to be used primarily for induction of general anesthesia um, or for um, episodic use in, in individuals undergoing very painful um, procedures such as a dressing change in the burn unit or a reduction of a, of a, of a fracture. Um, and in high doses, it could cause a dysphoria, hallucinations, psychosis, um, flashbacks. And so for a number of years, it fell out of favor, but it's having a resurgence over the last uh, several years, um, again, because it's very, very favorable effects, um, particularly when used in low doses or particularly when used in combined with propofol, when it goes by the moniker of ketafol. There is no preparation that one can buy that's ketafol, but it's when you add one or two milligrams of ketamine to every 10 milligrams typically of propofol, um, and then it goes by uh, ketafol. Um, and the two of those drugs tend to balance each other quite nicely. Um, but ketamine causes intense amnesia, it's a sedative, um, it doesn't cause respiratory depression, in fact it can actually stimulate respiratory drive and it can stimulate maintenance of airway reflexes um, and maintenance of the airway and that's primarily why it's particularly good in sedation cases, particularly in cases where you may not have access to the airway as we mentioned with the uh, plastic surgery um, and you may not be able to use a supraglottic airway or a, uh, even a supplemental oxygen. It is not associated with post-op nausea and vomiting. It is not an anti-emetic the way propofol is, but it's much like dexmedetomidine and it does not increase nausea and vomiting. The reason ketamine and propofol are such ideal partners is that ketamine is basically a stimulant and, and propofol is basically a depressant. And so the two of them tend to balance each other out when used in combination. Um, other drugs that are commonly used in um, sedation but actually are problematic um, often are the opioids. Um, remifentanil is a, um, a favorite because it's a short-acting, quick onset, quick offset, um, no active metabolite, um, and does not have to be metabolized by the liver. In fact, it's hydro hydrolyzed by nonspecific esterases. Um, it gives intense analgesia, um, but it also results in respiratory depression. 
um, skeletal muscle rigidity. It causes all opioids, as always do, post-op nausea and vomiting. Um, and there may be an increased risk of aspiration, particularly when used for endoscopy, because it may result in even more profound oral pharyngeal dysfunction than other uh, sedative agents. Um, fentanyl is just a much more a uh, familiar drug to most uh, anesthesiologists because it's been around for a very long time. It can be used as, as bolus doses. In fact, most commonly used as bolus doses, um, but actually can be used as an infusion as well. It has a longer duration than remifentanil. It has essentially the same effect profile. Um, however, it is metabolized in the liver um, as all opioids are other than remifentanil. Um, the issue with the opioids are particularly is they're also synergistically um, result in cardiac depression, depression and respiratory depression when used with uh, benzodiazepines and propofol, which are the other two common drugs that we mentioned are used for sedation. I'm not going to go over this in detail, especially in the essence of time, but I put it in there for your reference. Um, but again, midazolam can be used as bolus doses or infusion. Propofol can be used as a bolus doses or infusion. Dexmedetomidine should not be bolus. If dexmedetomidine is bolus, you will see much more profound bradycardia and typically hypertension initially. So dexmedetomidine is only given as an infusion. Fentanyl can be given as both bolus and infusion, as well as remifentanil. Um, and ketamine can be used as both bolus and an infusion. Um, and catafol can be used as both a bolus and an infusion. Be careful because some of these drugs, such as particularly dexmedetomidine um, and midazolam um, and fentanyl, are used as milligrams or micrograms per kilogram per hour, as opposed to our usual familiarity with propofol, which is given as micrograms per kilogram per minute. Um, so a, an important point with any um, uh, monitored anesthesia care is attention to providing analgesia. Now, not all procedures that require macro sedation are painful procedures. Um, in fact, some of them are simply diagnostic procedures, such as a you know colonoscopy, which technically um, there may not be any activation of true opioid receptors. Um, but um, certainly when there's any kind of surgery that's being done, um, then one needs to uh, pay attention to providing analgesia. Um, increasingly, uh, providing analgesia starts in the preoperative period um, when one anticipates um, getting drugs on board that will help the patients when they're uh, either under anesthesia or waking up from anesthesia. Gabapentin is commonly used, particularly in patients who have uh, chronic pain or patients who may have a, a, um, a de uh, depression or a complex pain um, syndrome um, or patients who are taking already uh, potent uh, opioid drugs. COX-2 drugs, particularly celecoxa, because of its lack of effect on bleeding and platelet function, um, um, can be used because uh, they're only available, celecoxa is the only COX-2 available in the United States, and it's only available as an oral agent, so you can give it to the patient orally preoperatively. Um, rather than um, waiting postoperatively when they may not be able to take oral medications. Um, regional anesthesia, planning to do regional anesthesia can result in both an excellent anesthetic as well as uh, uh, the best uh, postoperative analgesia. Interoperatively, one should target using drugs such as ketamine because it's through its prop NMDA uh, uh, properties um, can result in uh, both profound intraoperative analgesic uh, effects as well as uh, that can extend into the postoperative period. Administering um, NSAIDs, Ketorolac is the only intravenous NSAID available in the United States, um, and it is um, does have a, a effects on platelets. There may be concerns about bleeding, so just be certain that there's no contraindication from a surgical perspective is using an NSAID. Beta blockers, when used interoperatively, have been shown to decrease the hemodynamic response to stim the stimulus of surgery and actually result in a lower postoperative pain in the pack in the re uh, recovery room in the postoperative period compared to when um, opioids are used interoperatively to treat hemodynamic perturbations. Um, dexamethasone or decadron not only has been shown to decrease the post-op nausea and vomiting, but also result in higher patient satisfactions and decrease um, um, analgesic use and uh, decrease uh, pain postoperatively. Um, surgeons using local anesthetics on the field can significantly decrease the amount of anesthesia you have to use and again result uh, in post-op analgesia. 
Um, acetaminophen can be used both pre, intra, and post operatively if you're lucky enough to have the intravenous form of it. But remember, it can also be given orally and it can be given as a suppository. Um, in general, one should think about trying to avoid the use of opioids. Opioids not only have been shown to increase post op nausea and vomiting, in fact, of all of these medications that I have listed here, they're the only ones that significantly um, increase post op nausea and vomiting. Uh, but they've also been shown to increase post operative pain. Patients become tolerant to opioids very quickly, um, and opioids can actually activate pain pathways in many patients. Which of the following is a true statement? A, mild sedation never compromises the airway. B, non-anesthesia personnel should not provide deep sedation. C, entitled CO2 does not have to be monitored when providing sedation. D, a patient receiving deep sedation is not expected to respond to a painful stimulus. E, breath holding is always a sign of respiratory depression. So if you listen to my lecture, hopefully you should be able to answer this question. Which of the following is a true statement? That's True, non-anesthesia personnel should not provide deep sedation purposefully because they are not trained to rescue from general anesthesia. And typically, one should be trained to rescue from general an the next higher level of sedation. So it's typically recommended that non-anesthesia personnel simply target moderate sedation, realizing that they may be moving over into the deep sedation range. One, again, must monitor entitled CO2 when providing moderate to deep sedation if you're an anesthesia provider. Um, and, you know, whenever you see the never or always in an answer, that's almost never the correct answer. And it's almost always the incorrect answer when you see almost or never in the answer. Um, is MAC any safer than general anesthesia? Many times surgeons say, oh, the patient's really sick, we know, but we, I can do this with just a little MAC. Well, it's uncertain according to ASA claims database. Um, there are typically fewer MAC cases overall um, that are brought to um, malpractice and fewer of those in the claims database. Um, however, um, they, uh, about 40% of the MAC claims have resulted in both either death or permanent brain injury, which is uh, exactly the uh, same um, or slightly higher to that uh, in GA. So um, most injuries from MAC are related to oversedation, respiratory depression, and ultimately a hypoxic injury. And interestingly enough, the payout for uh, harm under MAC is significantly greater typically than the payout for that under GA. Unclear why that is. Maybe it's that you know MAC is provided for patients who are undergoing more, for example, elective surgeries as opposed to what's considered sort of life-saving surgeries. So, you know, if you come in to have some plastic surgery um, and you're harmed by that, perhaps you're more likely to sue because you're more unhappy than if you came in to have your, you know, lung cancer surgery. So there is definitely an art of MAC. There's a science. One must know the pharmacology, the physiology of these drugs that you're using. You must know the implications and how to monitor patients and recognize um, uh, the complications. Um, the, the, some of the complications of oversedated patients are similar to the complications of undersedated patients. In fact, both of these patients can be disinhibited and uncooperative. So a disinhibited, uncooperative patient is moving. The first reaction may be to give that patient more anesthesia so that they will hold still so the surgeon will stop complaining. Um, but sometimes that patient is um, and that's true that the patient is under sedated and they need more medication to stop them from reacting to the stimulus. But often it means that that patient is, is just becoming disinhibited and uncooperative and they're over sedated and they're obstructing. And the actual uh, appropriate response is to lighten your depth of anesthesia. But the over sedated patient is, is, is more likely to have hypoxia, hypercarbia, and cardiovascular instability. Um, airway obstruction, where the under-sedated patient is more likely to be hypertensive, tachycardic, and more likely to move and either interfere with the procedure, hurt themselves, or hurt someone else. Um, so let's talk about liposuction. A 54-year-old male is, is just had a liposuction, and the recovery room nurse pages you because the patient just started suddenly shaking and is now unresponsive after she gave him ondansetron because he complained of, of nausea and vomiting. During the case, the, patient, the surgeon had remarked that the patient had very dry skin and a lot of excoriations over his abdomen, where was where the liposuction had been done. What is the likely cause of the patient's shaking and unresponsiveness in the recovery room now? 
A, an underlying seizure disorder, B, a febrile seizure from cellulitis, uh, C, allergic reaction to the ondansetron, D, probably not a seizure, E, local anesthetic toxicity. So which of those is the most likely cause? And yes, it's local anesthetic toxicity. Um, um, tumescent anesthesia um, was developed by plastic surgeons and is the use of very dilute, very large volumes of local anesthetics during liposuction procedures. Um, these can result in significant absorption of the local anesthetic uh, with high serum levels, which can result in the typical local anesthetic toxicity um, that we see from other intravascular injection or from intravascular injections or other situations of local anesthetic toxicity, which uh, can be central nervous system, um, lethargy, coma, then seizure, um, or if high enough levels of local anesthetics, cardiovascular um, dysrhythmias, cardiovascular collapse. But tumescent anesthesia um, means literally firm and swollen. Um, it has been used to significantly limit the use of general anesthesia, which was, was used before that for almost all liposuction cases. Um, as I mentioned, surgeons are using large volumes of dilute solutions. Um, the, the, the suction catheter that they're using to suck out the fat, which is essentially what liposuction is, is just sucking out fat, um, is equipped to um, have a continuous inflow of this solution. Um, so as they're uh, moving this um, device in and out, they're both uh, local anesthetic is flowing inward um, and then being um, suctioned out along with the fat. Um, the lidocaine is, is usually diluted down to a 0 0.05 to 0.1%. Usually they add epinephrine um, in a, um, a very low concentration uh, because this is, it's usually one to one million because of the lowest concentration that is effective for vasoconstriction, but they don't want the patients to have high levels of epinephrine because one can see epinephrine toxicity as well with tachycardia and hypertension. Um, some surgeons add sodium bicarbonate, which decreases the pain and speeds the onset of the local anesthetic. But the principle is, is that it's both numbing up the area as well as vasoconstricting capillaries. Um, it has been shown this technique to decrease, uh, result in decreased blood loss um, and decrease absorption of the local anesthetic, which is the lidocaine, by adding the epinephrine to it. Um, however, there are, uh, the patients are left with often a large depot of this solution in their uh, body, which then can continue to be absorbed. In fact, it's estimated it's absorbed for another up to 24 to 36 hours. That's why when frequently when patients have had complications of uh, local anesthetic toxicity, they occur in the recovery room or they occur after the patient has gone home already. Um, they often use quite high doses of local anesthetics, as much as 35 to 55 milligrams per kilogram. Um, but again, because the idea theoretically is, is that it's a lot of this local anesthetic is being sucked out along with the fat, um, or the vasoconstricting agents are allowing it to stay vasoconstrict, or say, staying um, there in the, the uh, fat tissue, it's not being absorbed systemically, it's not reaching high enough intravascular levels. Um, so usually the peak concentration is less than five mics per uh, milliliter, um, which is considered the threshold for the development of lidocaine toxicity. Um, sometimes they will add corticosteroids uh, to reduce post-op inflammation. Generally, these are not enough steroids to result in adrenal suppression. Um, complications include hyponatremia because these solutions are typically very hyponatremic and the patient uh, can also have volume overload, pulmonary edema, um, they can obviously, as we mentioned, have local anesthetic toxicity. They can get tachycardia and hypertensive, either from the epinephrine or from the excess volume. They can develop seizures from the local anesthetic toxicity, um, and they can develop cardiac arrest and arrhythmias and even death with high enough levels of local anesthetic toxicity. In fact, there have been several reports through the years of patients um, dying from um, uh, local, presumably local anesthetic toxicity after liposuction, which results in many states putting regulations, strict regulations on how long the procedures can be, how many areas of the body can be done at, at one setting. For example, you know, if they're going to do the anterior abdomen, um, then they can't do, you know, all forearms and legs. Um,
The risk factors include high volumes of local anesthetic, um, concomitant sedation, which can result in hypercarbia, which can result in increased uh, uh, um, arrhythmias or seizures from local anesthetic, higher local anesthetic levels. Um, also use of other drugs that can decrease the metabolic pathways or the metabolic um, uh, yes, pathways for lidocaine, which re reduces the clearance of the lidocaine. Um, and these patients can also suffer significant blood loss. And in fact, uh, sometimes patients will actually require blood.